You're listening to South City Radio 94.4 FM with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, on the Friday Sports Show. The Friday Sports Show, we're very fortunate to bring you some of the world-class, well, some of the best athletes in the world from the local area, from around the world. We bring you all the local sport as well. We really want to promote local sport and make people aware of sporting opportunities, how to get involved in as a volunteer, and also just recreationally, and, and all the way through to top flight, we bring in coaches, sports people. The goal of the show is to increase awareness in sport and increase participation. We've been very fortunate to have some fantastic guests today. We have two fantastic guests, We're very privileged to have guest of this caliber coming on the show is going to give us a, a really fascinating insight into their latest book and just to build up the intro a little bit and get you all in, in, a, in a bit of suspense it's a really you're in for a real treat today if you any sporting enthusiast and even if you're not a sporting enthusiast you like listening to the show because we bring you some really fascinating guests today is going to be a really fascinating interview and just a bit of a, a, a teaser for you and i i first met um well, one of our guests uh, many, many years ago when I was co-facilitating, uh, I was helping out on a program. Um, it was a program that involved getting the best out of people and, and modeling excellence, you know, cutting a long story short, with a really fantastic uh, trainer from, from the U.S. And sort of cutting a long story short, uh, I, I met one of the day's guests on the show and we, we shared a common vision, not just in the game of sport, but also outside the game too. And, you know, you just connect with some people pretty much straight away and we did. And I found some of his ideas and ethos in sport and the other work he was doing really fascinating. It's been really great to reconnect uh, recently and and we talked about his his recent book and and the book we're going to talk about today is gold dust how to become a more effective coach quickly and how to become a better communicator and there's probably not many better people placed to talk about this than our guests today um keith meyer and and david meyer welcome to the show um great to have you on board good morning jim morning jim no, thanks fan- for inviting us on yeah that's no, fantastic and keith you know, the, the the book itself, I, I downloaded the book and I managed to, to, to read the book and I'll definitely read it again. It's one of those books, I think, you've, at least for me, um, the way I learn, you've got to revisit it. And, but I've already got a lot out of it, you know, some really key points. And I'm sure you can explain better than me and our listeners um, more about the book. But let's sort of start from the beginning, the inspiration to write the book. I mean, I think that the, I, I sort of... Having read the book and having spoken to you uh, off air and yourself and, and your son David, you, you sort of put together this book. And what was the inspiration? Where did it sort of begin? Um, what was that sort of vision that you guys had in, in first instance to sort of create this book? Well, I was coming back from London in May. I've been down there for a week and uh, shortly back by train, my son David was heading back to the States, which is where he works and lives there now, and started to write a book 15, 16 years ago, Jim, and I couldn't get past the first sentence. It was more about more about trying to clarify what the you know, rationale why I was writing a book. You know, it was, uh, it was never... Uh, so really... Uh, it, it was just an inspirational thought. I then rang David up. I said, listen, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to re- yeah. reignite the interest. And he, he, he said, well, I'll help you. And so it really started from there. And, and I couldn't have I couldn't have had anybody better than David working alongside me. He's, he's uh, you know, I'm not being humble about it. He actually did most of the writing. Mm. And uh, without him, the book would still probably be in a, in my head. Yeah. So, you know, I got to thank him so much for for all the hard work that we put in at Starbucks. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Many many hours at Starbucks as well. So that's really where it started. So I, I just think is what people tend to have is they have thoughts and mm. they just keep them as a thought and. Yeah. You know, from my from my perspective, I've got to the point now where you gather and corral enough information and knowledge, and it's all relative, isn't it? But mm. you then have to do something with it. So, you know, with with, with David with me, 
it was it's it's been a a really good journey to to work together as father and son mm. but equally to be able to get all everything out from you know my my understanding of sports and it's it's a sports book it's not any it's not a sport specific mm. but uh but Davey was able to articulate it, put it into a, a manageable and readable format. Mm. Uh, so that's that's really how it started, and it was a and it was a fantastic journey because <clears throat> that was in May. And we only actively started to do any so the written form format of it uh, around sort of July, middle of July, mm. where yeah. we interviewed uh, we interviewed one or two people. Uh, who were actually in the book, uh, the likes of Darren Moore and uh, Justin Albrook, who's from a different sport altogether, a Superman uh, mm. from rugby league. Yes. Uh, Kevin Harper, who's a, a world champion Muay Thai, and then of course the rest of the people who are in there, like Pete Sturgis, Nick Marshall, who's the assistant academy manager at at uh, Liverpool Football Club. Steve Iway, of course, the legend, and and then there are other people who, who, who we who we could have had in the. Uh, so it's not it's not a comprehensive list. It's a list of people that we know, and that's how it started. And mm. so it's been a sharing of their experiences as well. So it's we're really pleased with the outcome. Yeah, no, I think it's really interesting you say, and you, you sort of mentioned there you worked on the book and, and together with your son, and um, I think that's really uh, powerful in the sense that I think, I mean, I, I guess anyone who's listening who's, who's, who's got children, and, and certainly I've got children, and I think, you know, working with them in a professional capacity um, is quite unique in the sense that we we sort of have an identity um, with our children, but then for your son to work with yourself, obviously a really well respected coach uh, in the field. I guess my question is to to David: What was it like to to work? Um, I mean, for for you as sort of dad, to everybody else is it's it's, it's Keith the, the coach, and, and it all seems that way. What was the experience like to work um, with your dad on this book? I mean, I think it would would have been a, an amazing experience in terms of you know having children myself and. And having that special bond, but how would you describe it, David, working with with your dad? It was really good. Um, I mean, we spent, like my dad mentioned, we spent uh, we spent countless hours in Starbucks together. Um, I think the the really the really cool thing about it was I was getting stories that my dad had told. I was getting stories that I'd seen him present, yeah. um, and taking them and. Uh, and putting them in a written form where I'd seen how many people he'd affected over the years and helped and mentored to then be able to get those stories and, and put them onto a onto a piece of paper that could then go out to, to masses, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but also from that was the amount of stuff. There was stuff in the book that I've, I, from my experiences that I put in, but the actual writing of it, I learned so much just from writing the book itself. Mm. Absolutely, and I think what's interesting, um, David, is this sort of you know the, the, the mutual respect. Obviously, you know, father and son, and, and there's a strong bond there. But also, there's a, a mutual professional respect. I mean, you know, Keith sort of um, your dad speaks really highly of you and has a lot of respect for you as, as a coach. Um, but equally, uh, vice versa. What's it like to to write a book together? Professionally, do you have sort of moments where it can be uh, challenging, or I mean, what, what was the whole experience like? The whole journey from sort of start to finish. It seems to me that you complement each other really, really well. Um, but sort of no doubt uh, along the way, you know, professionally, um, what was the actual journey like? Well, I think it was a matter of establishing what the boundaries were and are, and. David's skill set, my skill sets, they complement each other. Uh, as I say, it took me 15 years or so, or 15 years ago, or so ago, I started to write a book, so I'd still be writing the book. Mm. Where David's skill set, he could put it into, he could, you know, he could put, I could, I could explain it, but I can't write as quickly as I could explain it. So I'd then go back to the same sentence, rewrite. So. It was very, very 
uh, useful in having David on board with me because we knew it's just, we knew although it'd be a journey we knew the journey was going to be a good one because mm. the relationship that we have is is extremely special Absolutely. and i don't i don't feel i feel blessed to to call david my son i'm proud of everything that he's done and and he's doing so far he he's got to be as a coach himself and he's doing very very well for himself uh Equally as a businessman, you know, David's David's doing very well. So mm. I think it was a matter of what the boundaries were. I wouldn't step on his toes. It'd be often many, many occasions. He said, have you read? He'd write something. Have you read it? <laughs> Give it to me. And yeah, yeah. You know, I'd say very little other than he'd just go back to the drawing board. Or But when it was ready, uh, mm. th th there was... You know, we just let him. I just let him get on with it. He had free free reign to do whatever is necessary to make it work. Mm. I just know that that due to the the abilities that I think we both have, and it was it was it was organic in nature. But it's like everything, Jim. We have a mm. you get a gut feeling about specific things. We might like what we hear. Mm. We certainly might. We might like what we see, but ultimately, it's football and sports in general are a, they're a feeling sport. And when you get the right feeling about something, you're going to go with it. Mm -hmm. And and we did. And so, you know, it, there was seeming a, a, a vast amount of time spent, but done in such a quick period of time from start, from inception through to where it is at the mm -hmm. moment. Where the book is at the moment, it's it's a number one bestseller on Amazon, mm -hmm. and and has been a number one bestseller uh, twenty four hours after going live on Amazon. So yeah, we just went with the flow, and but in re in regards to the relationship and w how did that partnership work? I, as as I said earlier, I I couldn't have picked a selected, and I mentioned it to our fathers out there. If you, or dads, you know, you've got to tell, you've got to give them your son, your daughters, you've got to give them license, uh, poetic license, one, and two, you've got to give them the opportunity to to go and find out what it is and what how good they can become. And so I know David, he's, he's very, he's academically very, very bright and... Mm. I know his skill set. His skill set is, is his writing is exceptionally good. My my skill set is my yeah. experiences and jumping it onto a piece of paper. Yeah, would have been. I, I got stigmatised by it many times. And although we've wrote, there's one book out, and it's as I say, it seems it's, it, it seems to be attracting, and doing quite well. The reviews are very very good. Yeah, uh, it's a matter of knowing what you're capable of doing and. It's no man in his own. No man is his own island. You've got to tap into somebody else's skill sets, and if you've got the ability to be able to do everything, which is fantastic. If you've not, it's recognising what your what your shortfall might be. Mm, absolutely. And, uh, so no. it was, it's been a great experience, Jim, and it'll continue. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's fascinating, and it, I think it really is. Now, listeners will, will be listening, um, no doubt, you know, fascinated by the journey, the experience, and we'll sort of delve into the book now and, and talk about the actual book and, and go into details now, you know, how to become a more effective uh, coach. Um, now, there's a lot of books, well, I'd say there's a lot of books out there, but we, we sort of see books about communication, coaching, and this is quite unique from what I I can see um, and one of the reasons it's unique is I think that the book goes a bit deeper um, at least this is in my opinion in, in, in people's psyche and I, I think for me that you can be the most knowledgeable coach in the world you can have all the credentials um, academically and, and, and you can go to all the courses and you can, you can be uh, articulate even as a communicator but one of the key things for me is connecting with 
the players, the performers. Um, and I think the book sort of goes into that, um, but know that you can explain it much better than what I can. Um, connect with players, Keith, uh, and, 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 and David, Keith and David, I've sort of put the question above you. Connecting with players, how important is it for a coach to be able to connect with their players. And I know it's a cliche and we see people talk about connecting with players, but from your point of view, from your, the way you see uh, the world and your experiences, how, do you th- how important do you think it is as a coach to go in there and, and build a connection with the, uh, the performers? I think, Jim, arguably, for me, I think it's the most important thing mm. because, you know, there's a lot of talk about X's and O's and and tactics and and technique and you can have as a coach all the knowledge in the world around those those details but if you aren't able to build a relationship with somebody build a connection with somebody all you've got is your opinion Mm. because if they don't like you or they don't really connect with you and they don't want to listen to you um what you're sharing is pretty irrelevant. So mm, mm. I think if, if they don't like you, they're, they're more likely to, to critically analyze everything you say. Yes. Whereas if you've built and you've spent time building a relationship and building a connection with somebody, it doesn't mean that people are always going to agree with you. Mm. But there's a much higher chance that they will listen and they will take on board what you're saying. So... That's why a lot of the a lot of the coaches in the book have they're, they were they've been incredible in regards to building relationships and mm-hmm. and and building connections with people and with groups to the point where they can then express the knowledge that they have because really only when you've got the the relationship and the connection can you then take that forward and and show people what you know. Absolutely, that's a really good point, um, David. That sort of I sort of reflect on on some of my own experiences on my own journey there, and I think it's it's, it's paramount that we've got that sort of rapport and connection uh, with the players, and the players wanting to sort of to, to, to perform for the coach as well is a big thing. And but what I find interesting, and I wonder what you guys, uh, what your take is on in, in my experience, and I'm not going to sort of mention names uh, on my own journey. Everyone does the best they can in their own journey, but there's also that other element too where at least I've seen um, certain coaches and they don't generally um, last too long in, in the sport in terms of the, the intention they've got for the players. Um, I think what's really important, one thing that sort of certainly strikes me from speaking to you guys, you want the best for the players. You want them to succeed for themselves, not for you guys, for them. And is that, am I, am I sort of correct there in saying that um, that the sort of the ethos and, and what I'm getting from reading the book and, and speaking to you guys is you generally want the best for the players for themselves and and if so how important is it as a coach to want the best for, for the players for them to succeed for themselves if, if nothing else athletes Jim they they want three things I know there are more but there are three primary things they want to know that you care for me Mm. That's what they want. They, they also want to know that you can you help me. Mm. The third thing is, can I trust you? Now those take time. That those three things take time. You might be able to help the player initially through a one game and a one off. So you know, currently in the Premier League, there's been changes at the in the managerial level at a couple of big clubs. And uh, I'm sure they'll both do well. And then you can get on the flip of that where there is a change that takes place and it's it's superficial. It tends to be more, uh, you know, they're trying to motivate the players, of which I'm not a true lover of the word motivation. It's a short term. Mm-hmm. But the, the primary, the, those three things, can I trust you? Do you care? Uh, can you help me? comes through the want and desire to to want to help them and in terms of relationships and connection people are very very they'll quickly suss out athletes and people in general is if you're after something from Mm -hmm. them they'll suss that so when going into a relationship 
you know, the, we're going to look at the syntax, the order in which we go into these relationships. It's do you go in to work with players or athletes or air athlete where you, what can you get back from them? Mm -hmm. Or what is it you can give them? What is it you can help them with? And if there's a genuine, genuine current, so it comes from inside of you, inside of the coach, the players and the, the athlete will suss that out. <clears throat> They'll sense that. Mm -hmm. And as David's already uh, already mentioned, is that the the, the unconscious mind will it will suss out very cleverly, and it will it will weigh up from the way you interact with the athlete, the way you approach them, even down to the your, your little nuances, little mannerisms, the volume of your voice, the the tonality. Mm -hmm. uh, They'll suss that out whether you're with them or you're not. Absolutely. And equally, if you're not, if you've lost that trust, <clears throat> if you lose the trust right from the beginning, you know, because that that takes a it takes an element of time. It does take time to build trust. <clears throat> but the, when they genuinely find out that you're there to help them mm. first, rather than what you can get from them, it's a slightly different relationship that takes place. Absolutely. And there's a, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a, where I currently work, you know, my, my office space, which is, it's where the players are coming into the actual building itself. I don't, I don't go out, outside, I'll go outside, but I'm not in an office space where there's a, where you sat and there's a desk, it's, as the players are coming on in, it's, you know, there's a, there's a genuine care of, you know, um, uh, there's a response, and basically what I'm doing is acknowledging and asking specific questions of them as they come through. Uh, you know, how's your day been? That's a simple question, but it's the quality of the questions. Yes. And the sincerity um, behind it, yeah, absolutely, Keith. Uh, um, that, and that, that, that's where you, you know, rather than how's your day been, and then you, you're moving on to the next athlete because you're not engaged yeah, with them. Exactly. Like, uh, exactly. And that's important. And it's a start. It, it's not the it's not the cure all. It's not the it's not going to be the, the defining factor whether players or athletes are going to become you know, a professional athlete. Jim, it isn't. It's about connecting to the level mm. where you're making them feel important. Absolutely, you're making them. You're gonna. You've got to. That's where it's got to start. And I, I know it's. Every every relationship on the planet has got to start with how do we connect? And you know, it's it, it, there are strategies out there that are genuine, but they do work. And hmm. you know, I just think if you start from that place, then you've got a it, it's a good foundation to build from. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. That's an important point, and that sort of I reflect when you mentioned that um, many years ago um, in coaching, the the big thing was giving players praise. And I'm not sure if you recall, but there was a big movement in in the coaching industry to sort of give the the, the players and performers praise. And I felt that what happened, in my opinion, what coaches were doing it for the sake of doing it. And I thought, well, if you're going to praise someone incongruently, you may as well not do it at all because it's not going to mean anything thing when you do and th there is a danger of becoming a, um, a a robot or a clone as a coach so to speak uh, at least looking at things from my perspective um, Keith and I think from from your you know, from, from your point of view with your vast experience um, what would you say in terms of praising the athletes and what's your position on that uh, uh, Keith is there a fine line between you know being genuine and saying well you need to improve that uh, and also is there a fine line between say okay uh, you know telling a player some home truths and saying well you need to improve here you're doing this well and what's your sort of take on on on, on praising players what, what's your um, what's your take on that if you there's two things Jim if you if you're in if you're in a performance environment whereby you know you go for you can either be performance happy or you can be result happy mm. and if you're in the if you're in the uh, the elite level then of, of course results are massively important if you're in the development 
uh, uh, process or in the development of, of, of athletes. It's a slightly different take. Mm. However, I think athletes, again, congruently, whereby they will understand if you if you are genuine in your in your thoughts, where you're honest. I just call it KFC. <laughs> KFC and yeah. KFC is where well, you're kind. Yeah. You're fair and firm, and you care for them, mm. and you've got to be consistent. And, and athletes have got to see that consistency. They've got to see it from an external as, you, as you're communicating to a, an athlete. Those that are surrounding it and watching and observing from the outside looking in can see something taking place as an interaction. And sometimes the firmness they can see and, and they can, you know, the, the, the picking up, they can sense that there's, there's something either stern taking place or you've been extremely caring to them. And they, they can observe this and they'll sense what's currently taking place. So if you're going to if you're going to patronise athletes just for the sake of telling them to bring them on side, <coughs> where <coughs> constantly all you're doing is you're you're affirming everything that they do and their effort, and the run, and their or, or the work rate is very very good, which is great for the younger mm. athletes. Where you were, and I just seen that 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 was a fantastic. I saw you then running. <coughs> that was brilliant. Well done. I love your effort. Mm. And then, of course, you're affirming a young athlete's ability. Sometimes they just don't know. They don't know. They're just running. Mm. Absolutely. If, if, you know, fr from a footballing context, then they'll just run. But if you refer, if you can confirm that what they're doing is is of a benefit to them, because that's where athletes, if you can give it so that they get the benefit and they understand it, because you articulate it in such a way whereby. You know, you, you've seen something, you've observed it, and sometimes, it, from a footballing point of view, where you're observing them away from the ball, so if mm -hmm. we're defending, uh, or there's a run, you know, we're, we're attacking, and you're not looking at the player in possession, you're looking at the players away from the ball, and you you pick one player out, and you, I saw that run, I saw what you did, I saw it, that was brilliant, well done. And that's, that's different. If you're going into the performance... So the results are important. Then it, it, praising effort should be a give me. Mm -hmm. Just turning up and praising them just because they're running, they're getting you know in the professional level, they're getting paid for that. Absolutely. So, so praising their effort, it, it's it's them, it's praising the things that they they should be that you know the things that they did from from what the result. So the outcome is we just scored a goal, and you know from a. You know, from a centre forward, a footballing perspective, where a forward he scores a great goal, and you've been practicing that during the week or something similar to it, then I and I feel there's a there's a there's a spot where you have to affirm it. Mm. I, I think I think overall we're we're very good at finding what we're not good at, mm -hmm. and in general, and it's it's my take on it. I think we're in a, a, a society now whereby, you know, uh, you've got to praise things to get them on side. And I just think we're going too far down a slightly different route. If somebody does well, you've got to tell them. Absolutely. And, and silence sometimes can work, and I know it does do. But equally, you've got to get to know the individual and what their needs are, what actually fires and triggers them off. Mm. If if praise is something that they require, because well we're going to know that, and I, I just I just think we're you know we're, we're we're very as a society we're we're very very good at mm. you know looking looking for things that athletes are uh, they're not good at. Whereby if you if we focus slightly a slightly different focus, we will look at what they are good at and start from that point. Mm. Then everything after that. Is going to be of a benefit for them and 
Sure is. Absolutely. I think so. And I think that there's lessons to be learned, certainly in, in my experiences and opinion in the academic system where sometimes it's easy to focus on what people got wrong rather than what they got right. And I'm not sort of saying to gloss over the, the you know, any, any problems, obviously they need to be addressed, but equally in saying that it gives people a lot of confidence to, to sort of focus that they are. I mean, if you got five out of 10 in a test score and you focus on the five you got wrong, um, and don't focus on the five you got right, and think, well, what do I need to, get to do to get the six? Then, then it's easy to, you know, from, from a, to blow someone's confidence out of the water. And I think what you say makes a lot of sense. And no doubt our listeners who are aspiring to be coaches, but also life in general. I think one thing that strikes me about the book, and, and the way I sort of see the book too, there are many transferable skills to life uh, in general too. And you know, one of the hardest jobs. Um, well, at least that is from, 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 from my perspective and, and most important jobs that any of us can do is be the best parent we can be. And, and like coaching, you know, in some respects, parenthood, it's not always easy. It's because there's a fine line where you, 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 you want to be the best friend to your performers. You want to be the best friend to, you know, the, the, you know, we want to be best friends to our children, so on and so forth. But also, there's decisions you've got to make along the way. And in my experience over many years, I've met some great coaches uh, like yourself, key fantastic coaches. I've also met people who I've seen who maybe weren't as far in the development um, in, in respect to being uh, a great coach. But you've also got the, the people pleasers as well where they go in there and they're so focused on, on being, um, uh, portraying this image of, of yeah, and I think along the way you're going to upset people as a coach I think that people are going to disagree um, with, with the methods but what do you say to that Keith to any aspiring coach because it's not easy when, when you know performers aren't on your side and it's hard to please everyone in a team obviously um, and, and equally as a parent you know we all know sometimes you've got to make a decision that isn't, you think is in the best interest for, for the child but they might not see it at the time um, but we only hope in, in the future they do see that rationale but what's your take on that sort of fine line between getting the rapport connection but maybe not sort of trying too much to be um, like, you know, we, we, we've certainly seen and you've probably seen it yourself where some people sort of, they're so focused on being um, everyone's best friend and being these people pleaser and then they end up pleasing no one. What's your take when a young sort of aspiring coach um, sort of thinking, well, how do I manage that? How do I sort of get them on board but not sort of go too overboard? Yeah, look, I, I've got I've got a view on this, Jim. It's not the only view, and but you know, having coached now for thirty seven years, uh, you know, at varying levels, of, I just think is what we what we're going to be right from the start. And I know David's got experiences of this as well because he's currently going through uh, his air license, his uh, UEFA for air license as. We've just got to be honest. Uh, and if you're honest and consistent and being able to... Can I just think we, as coaches, we can tend to shun and keep parents out of the way. And that, parents are massively important on the decision-making. As a coach, I know they, they might have an, in, uh, an influence on younger coaches. Mm. Because if I, drop, if I drop little Johnny, I know his dad's or his mum's going to be on the case. Mm. Where sometimes there's a selection of, and I've heard it, whether you, were you going to pick on or you're not going to select little Freddie because, or Susan because the parents are going to be less maintenance. But I, I just think if we're honest and, te- and bring the parents in as a stakeholder and let them hear what's cur- what, what you're doing, and they, and and they know right from the start that you know I was saying look, look as per as a parent talking to parents because I've looked at it from as a coach looking out because I've had my and, and coaching uh, coaching athletes and then I've also been on the other side on the other side of the touchline where I've you know I've been watching my son or my daughter play who who, who have who've been involved and I'm watching it from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. But the, as a parent, all I ever wanted from coaches is to be... And I, no, no, look, when we say honesty, 
you know, we, well, I'm, you're no good. I'm, I'm not referring to that. I, I think there's levels of it, but mm. and there's levels of maturity around how coaches communicate their honesty to parents. But w- as a parent looking in as a parent, then, you know, as, I'm a stakeholder. I take my son, I take my daughter to, to games. I don't have to know the warts and all. All I need to know is... You know, what's the rationale and why he or she's not playing? I, again, I don't need to know that. What I do need to know is what can we do, what can he or she do to help, or what can we do to help them become better so that they are, you know, they're a participant. And and really, they're again, they're at different levels. Do you, as coaches and grassroots coaches, do you are, are we a performance-happy team mm. or are you a result-happy team or coach? And it's important because if if I if I go out and I start to and I'm not I'm a performance coach I want to develop athletes. Mm. Of course, results are important. It's, it is important. There's no doubt about it. You know, I think we if you want result if you don't want a result, well, why have in football? Why have goals? Absolutely. There's a direction, and winning is nice. I know there's there's places for every single player in the game now if you just want to turn up and play and just be great fantastic but if you're going to be if you're going to be in that type of you're going to get a, a, a group of athletes that all they want to do is turn up and play that's fun that's great if you're a coach however that wants results then that will be commensurate and your, your, your decisions will be based on you know you wanted to win as a coach but in actual fact you're losing the players Mm. Now, you, when I say losing the players, they lose art. You know the the way the coach will interact with the co- with the players, even down to how you interact with the parents. So, if it, so, being very very honest with, but listen, mm. and bring them in as a, you know, it's it, you're inviting the parents, you're inviting the players in grassroots football or uh, in, in any amateur sport. If you're inviting them in. Let them be a stakeholder in the actual decision making. Mm. Let them right. What? What? How do we want this season to be? Do we want to be a winning side? Do we want to just be a performance team? How do, and the players will tell, and mm. the and the parents will be involved in that. Yeah, when no. you when you have a separation from that, Jim, it, it becomes slightly different. And I, I'm going to invite David in if I may, Jim, yeah, because I know yeah. he's got experiences of this. Uh, as well. Absolutely, you know that would be great, um, David. If you could sort of share uh, your experience in terms of you know managing the the process as a coach. You know, parents want the best for their uh, children, but equally as a coach, it's one thing communicating to the players, but also to, to the parents too. And how, how do you find that yourself, uh, David, in communicating to? I mean, I've seen in my experience certain coaches uh, literally, uh, you know, metaphorically close the door and 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 sort of. But equally on the other side of it, you see some parents some times they're probably you know at least in my opinion not the best qualified maybe they're the best qualified in their own job but in coaching sometimes they can sort of step that mark but how as a coach can you sort of be sensitive enough to appreciate that they want the best for their child but you know you you are the coach you are the professional um what are some of your thoughts in communicating that yeah i think the the first thing is putting out the boundaries early on so from the start just letting them know where you're at and what your expectations are of of yourself as a coach, but also from the, the son or daughter as the athlete and from the parents. Because if you don't do that early, you can you can set yourself up to open up a can of worms later down the line when the parent's asking for something that you previously maybe should have addressed but you haven't done. Mm. So getting those the expectations out early and and as long as you do that and you're honest about it when things come back later down the line it you can refer back to it and it does make it it does make it easier but with the parents as long as they know that you've got the the son or the daughter's best interests at heart mm-hmm. you're not going to go too far wrong I know there will be I know you've mentioned that there'll be there'll be parents that maybe think they may know more than what they do, um, 
But if you've got the, the kid's best interest at heart, more times than not, you've got to be in a good place with them. Absolutely. I think that's a great uh, takeaway point for our, our, our listeners and especially aspiring coaches and, and, and people coaching at the moment, listening in and, and, and knowing that. I guess the other thing is too, that sort of confirmation bias as parents sometimes it's easy to sort of delete um, and sort of distort. Uh, you know, we all like to think that, you know, our, our child is, is um, sometimes, um, I wouldn't say better than what they are, but equally in saying that, you know, we, we've all sort of no doubt seen the parents who sort of, um, they, they kind of turn a blind eye to, to where uh, their, their, their child exactly is as a performer. And, you know, obviously being honest is a great start going forward. But is there a way of maybe uh, appraising the situation? I'm, I'm sure there's listeners listening in, especially academy coaches and, and people who coach at that level of the game where they're going to make big decisions. It's never pleasant making a decision where you've got to release a player. I can assure uh, anyone listening, you, you want to take everyone on board, but there's only so many places that you can you can take. But is there a way that people can, coaches can communicate to parents and say, well, okay, um, perhaps uh, your child isn't th- this sort of level here. I mean, maybe they will in the future, but at the moment... There's only, there's only so many places for so many positions, and is, is there a way to sort of communicate that in a sensitive way, and, and but also um, also give the the performer some confidence that they can carry on being the best they can be? Yeah, it, look, the I think if there are this is, it's a journey, and I think if the parents are brought along on this journey, so that. You either have biannual or you may have longer conversations with them because invariably what parents are wanting is they will, you know, they just want confirmation that their athlete, the son, the daughter is doing well. And although they, you know, never run away from the question because I always, look, parents never be afraid of asking the question. Mm. But be very mindful of the response you might get back. So, You know, if they're going to ask the questions, they might not actively like the response they're going to get in in reply. But, again, they're honesty, Jim, and the trust that they've got in with, they got with you. Because many, many parents, what they'll do is they'll allow their athlete to come to you, but I'm not sure how many athletes will give you the, give you the, you know, the, the, the the child 100% of the time. Mm Mm-hmm. They, 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 you know, they still want to hang on. They've got a, they've got a hang, they've got a anchor to them. They, they want to bring them to you, but they, they're at, are they trusting? Do they want to give you them all? That, and so, when parents actually give you the, when I say give you the child hundred percent, I'm referring to the time where they go right. Yeah, there you go. Just go out, go and play, go and run, do whatever it is, and just leave them. Let them just be there. Mm. Well, but many parents they, they tend to they tend to want to be known everything that's taking place and everything that's going on. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But mm. you know, I've worked with with athletes where the parents just literally drop them off and leave them. Mm-hmm. I've, I've worked with that. Where, where I've, I've equally worked with athletes. They, they drop them off, and the the, the mum or the dad or the parents will just go and have a chat somewhere else. You just. They'll either buy a chair and just let them get on with things. They don't, but yeah, and then you'll get the other ones where they're watching every single little move. Because, of course, in team sports, what what the parents will tend to do is they're only watching their little son or their daughter. Mm. They're not watching anybody else. They, they might be, and I'm sure they've got a, an interest, but you know, if it wasn't for their own son or daughter, they wouldn't be there in the first place. So Great point. Great what you've point. got to do in, what you've got to do is, with in dealing with the potential conflicts is this stakeholder process is not something that must be taken lightly. You've got to bring them in. And when I say bring them in, this is this, this is what the book partially is about, is about mm. connecting Absolutely. with your athletes. But, you know, the parents play a big part in this. Mm. And so how you how we then in, how we then communicate to the parents when there's the the likelihood of feedback taking place is on this journey from when they start or when they come in then then you know interim meetings or interim informal chit chats 
mm. you're actually allowing them in the foreign and, and to I think no, that's a really interesting point you made there, um, Keith. Now, I mean, yourself and, and, and David are, are really strong characters. And, if, you know, and knowing yourself, Keith, you know, you are a strong character with abundance of experience. And it takes a strong character to have that sort of open-door policy where you can come in and speak to me. There's coaches that will be listening uh, to the show thinking, OK, maybe they have a sense of insecurity maybe if they sort of um they put like a barrier up in terms of maybe a coach putting a barrier up to maybe protect themselves in, in one respect is there anything they can do to sort of think okay um being honest it, i think it takes an element of bravery to be honest and upfront with people also an element of strength to have the door open say okay you only got a knock on the door and i'm more than happy to, um, to speak to you about the player's development what can young coaches listening um do um, um if they're sort of wondering well they feel a sense of insecurity of of what's to come, what might be said, if they could sort of handle, um, you know, what the conversation's going to unravel. Um, Keith, what, what your experience? Yeah, what, what, what you could, look, that, again, if for any young aspiring coaches out there, what you've got to do is, is find a mentor and find somebody that you can trust who will be honest with you. So, and the reason why I say that, Jim, is because you're going to be you're going to be in a situation, no matter who you are, no matter how many years you've got under your you're under your belt. It, it, even nowadays, you hear the likes of Premier League managers, the younger ones, where they ring their older manager and ask them for advice. So, having someone on your side who's either they've got the belt. They've already had the experience or a experience similar to, then you tap into that. So mm. that's one thing. The second thing is, if you're going to go into interactions where you're unsure about what's likely, what the outcome is likely to be, and it might be a little frigid, it might be a little bit, uh, you're uncertain about it, then what you might need to consider doing is bringing someone else with you. Okay, yeah. So that. Yeah. So you've got you've got an ally on your side, someone that might have an experience in dealing with, mm. you know, that similar circumstance. You never really know how how, how interactions are going to take place until you're actually in them. We can assume something's going to be said or done. But so having someone on you with you rather than going in and having a one to one, you know, where it's informal, then you, you might bring someone else in and have somebody on your side, by your side, just uh, two things, as a witness, one, and two, you know, they've got the license to, you know, to share their, their wealth of knowledge, but you've got to invite them into the party as well, so, you know, that we can talk about it, but how specifically would it be done is, listen, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Smith, Mr. Mr. Mm. Uh, Mr. Jones, Mr. Smith, I brought along my colleague, my friend, whoever it may be, and, you know, at some point, you know, they feel, or we feel, is they've got something of benefit to bring to this conversation. Would you mind whether they actually share the knowledge? So mm. you, you're getting a buy-in from the parent <coughs> or the, <coughs> the, you know, the, uh, the, the person who's brought, the, who's bringing this conversation, this meeting together, then if you got that buy right from the start, then you're creating boundaries, you're creating the rules before you've even started the conversation, before you've got into the meat of it. Mm, uh, absolutely. So it, I just think, it, so those types of things, <clears throat> but again, it, it comes under <laughs> trust, it comes under benefit for them, and it comes under the pure honesty. And if you're honest right from the start with people, and not fluff them because they will remember. People will remember what you tell them. And if you're not, they are. They don't have a good memory about what you've said. So I, I, it's keeping things very simple and keeping it very, very to the point, and then moving along and leaving, leaving their leaving their interaction as you know 
because people, you know, the coaches, younger coaches will evade and avoid. Yeah. And, that, and so the younger coaches, what I would what I would advise them to do is, A, find a mentor. B, if you've got any interesting interactions that are about to take place, then maybe you, 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 you might have to invite another party in there just as a, just as an ally for you to, to support you. Yeah, that's great practical advice, Keith. I think that's, that's really tangible. And one thing that sort of struck me about the book, uh, fantastic book, the uh, How to Become a More Effective um, Coach Quickly, How to Become a Better Communicator, was the the influence that you've had on um, on your son, David. Obviously, if you're going to choose a mentor, there's probably not too many better than yourself, Keith, with your vast experience. And But what really strikes me about, um, you, you know, David, he's, he's sort of, you mentioned how important it is to have a mentor, and he probably couldn't, you know, living, obviously, um, you know, having a dad like yourself, you're not going to get a much better mentor than that. But the point being is that David's become his own coach, it seems to me, sort of become his own person. Now, you've got this mentor uh, as a young person. How important is it to be, I suppose this question goes to David, how important is it to be, you know that you've learned a lot, from your dad, um, but how important is it to be the your own man? And you are your own man, and I think what's or your own, you know, person, woman, whatever uh, is politically correct these days. But how important is it is, is to be your own self, your own coach, not not to, to, to try and be a clone of the mentor? Yeah, I think you know when you you grow up, <coughs> or when you're growing up, sorry, um, you from what you've what you've been around you you get your own values you get beliefs from from those people you've been around and and i think they stay with you uh they certainly have done with me so the values and beliefs that i've grown up around have stayed with me and and what i what i hold to be true um but then from there when you gain when you gather your own experiences and you gain experiences from from things that you do you can then evolve somewhat into your own person but with those values and beliefs that you had from the start anyway. So you, you have the values and beliefs, you get experiences, you build on it. And, and I think as well as that, for me, a big one is, is having other mentors too outside of, um, not just in sports. I've got, I've got a, a mentor that I, I would class as a friend as well, that he's in his seventies now. Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a really pretty crazy story how we met he's an american guy we by chance met him in in preston of all places Mm -hmm. in a in a in a hotel and that was seven years ago but he's been somebody that for me i've been able to to go to to bounce off Mm -hmm. to learn from to share ideas with but i think as time goes on and you get more experiences and you meet more people and and for me more mentors that i've got I've then been able to shape myself even more because I I have a better understanding of who I am now. I have a better understanding of what it is I do and and what it is I want to get out of other people as well. Mm. You know, absolutely. That's, that's a great point. I think, you know, for any, uh, anyone of any age listening, is, or any industry, be it sport or in, in any uh, sector, teaching, corporate, uh, it's invaluable uh, insights into to getting mentors. And I guess one of the, the challenges of, of, of the interview is to sort of, um, to, over the, time, the short time frame we have, is to sort of, with the vast experience of, of, of yourself, Keith and David, to fit it in, into, into this time frame, um, we're sort of running... Uh, <laughs> Time's getting the best of us, but I do want to mention very uh, um, briefly, but they can read more about it, the trust as well. I think it's really important that we talk about the trust. Um, some of the proceeds of the book go to the uh, the, the Giles Trust, I believe. Um, Keith, can you uh, briefly tell us about that, please? Yes, I can, Jim. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when we started to write the book, we were again, uh, we were just sat, and I'll never forget it, we sat in uh, Starbucks, and... Uh, you know, to give you to give some drive behind anything, you've got to have something that really, really pulls you, magnetises you, to draw you, to get you out of bed, to get moving. And we were sat. We decided. I lost a friend called uh, Dick Bert, and uh, so Dick Bert in the in the footballing world is synonymous. He's 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 he's, he's known worldwide. Uh, 
in terms of technical detail, coach Ed, you care to, was a maverick. He was, without doubt, one of the most interesting people I've ever met in my life. I've never heard him speak badly about man or, or woman. I'd known him, I'd known him then 37, 35 years. And, and so I was delivering a course uh, with Dick over in South Korea. We were deli delivering the, the mod, mod 2 of the pro license for the KF, KF, uh, uh, the KFA and uh, the, the Korean Football Association. Mm -hmm. And that was July 2017. In uh, 2018, I, uh, that was the last time, so I'm the last person on the planet to see and be in Dick's presence, watching him deliver practically, and to be in his in his lectures, which were magic. So anybody out there that's uh, that's uh, that been in his presence, I'll know exactly what I'm talking about. For the ones that are not and never been in the presence or have heard of Dick Bear, you need to look him up on YouTube. He is uh, an absolute legend. He was a license uh, director. He he. he he uh, built the academy managers courses, the football, which are no longer, and the pro license course, which, again, the inception of all of that, were, Dick was very instrumental in it all. So Dick passed in 2018. It was a, uh, he died of uh, a brain tumour. And, you know, we were sat in Starbucks and we decided to dedicate the book to Dick Baird. And... The, the trust that looked after uh, Dick was was the Giles Trust, the Brain Tumor Fund, and in his latter latter uh, latter days of life, yeah, they looked after him. So, ten percent of the profit of the proceeds from the book is is going to the Giles Trust, mm -hmm. and it, it means a lot to us. David, he'd been around Dick because David's a, a very very uh, I'm very excited for what's coming next for David. He's uh, he's a very very bright and very very capable coach. That's cutting his teeth. He's mentioned mentors. Uh, You've mentioned that it was very apt that you do. Dick was one of my major mentors in football, and uh, I feel extremely privileged to have him in my life as well. And I miss him. Uh, immensely, as as I'm sure many others will, as uh, you know, from the footballing uh, arena. So, you know, that's what that's what the book the book is dedicated to him, and uh, it just gave real purpose behind what he's wanted to get out of bed, Jim, and let's get this project sorted and mm. and, and get the book out there as quickly as we did. And all credit to David and. You know what he did. He, it was, the book started in. We started to write it in July. I really want to thank uh, Keith and David May coming on the show. It's been fantastic reviewing Goldust, how to be a more effective coach quickly, communicator, and it's a fantastic book to help get the best out of any athlete, but also transferable skills to be more efficient in in corporate too. And also, I think it's quite useful from a personal point of view, just being a generally better communicator. So it's been great. The time's going really fast. Thanks again, Keith and David, for being on the show, and I wish you every success uh, with the book going forward. You're listening to Southwest City Radio 94.4 FM, your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, on this Friday Sports Show.